Welcome to the main track. We're starting off with an introduction to Qt. I'll just leave everything to you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, as far as I know, this is the uh, Oslo juggling convention, right? <laughs> so uh, first, I need a round of applause to get me started because I'm not very good at this. Come on. All right. This is very nice. I can even show you a trick. Hey, come on. What are you doing? This is a serious convention. This is about oh. open source and development. Is it? Who are, who are you? What are you doing here? So my name is Frederik Laton. You may have seen me yesterday already. Um, I come from the open source uh, world. I have been contributing to KDE since 2005, I think. Uh, I have been using it forever. So I'm a Linux geek. Uh, been around for a while. But who are you taking my stage? <laughs> <laughs> my name is Nils Christian Roger Nielsen. Uh, I am um, working with the Qt company. I've been working with Qt for the past seven years. And uh, I am the serious guy that is going to take away all of your thunder. Um, I work uh, as a product manager. Uh, uh, yeah, there's my name. Awesome. Oh, wow. I'm on there, too. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it's almost as if we had planned this. So um, my claim to fame is uh, that in the last years, I made accessibility actually work so that blind people and people with other kinds of issues can nicely use Qt software, including uh, QML, uh, doing that on many platforms. Currently, I'm a team lead, uh, working with a bunch of developers, trying to get our Qt Quick offering to be as great as possible, make it work for everyone. And uh, I guess we can just get started. Yeah, I don't have a claim to fame, uh, but I've been working in the shadows in the support team and helping people uh, be successful with Qt, making their applications work. And I've been working in the sales team, trying to make people understand that there's also a value in buying Qt. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that today. I'll start by introducing Qt in general, what it is, where it comes from, and talk a little bit about our history as a company. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're offering and, and what it is that we are uh, delivering. Uh, and then Frederick and I will will both be talking a little bit about different things. So for those of you who don't know what Qt really is, it is a cross-platform application and or, or a C++-based cross-platform application and UI development framework. That is when I talk to people who have never heard about Qt, I think the one sentence that really encompasses everything about Qt. Well, let's just ask them, who knows Qt in this room? Yeah? And who has used Qt before? Okay, I, I see about the same hands. Cool. Uh, so what we're delivering, and uh, it's a number of different things. Uh, what we're working on is mainly, of course, the APIs. We're delivering a set of libraries. We're enabling you to develop your applications using those APIs and using uh, that functionality. But in itself, that's not very powerful. So we have, in Berlin, for instance, a huge team working on tooling. They're creating loads of different tools, uh, small ones, that really help streamline the process of developing your applications. And we package all of this together into our development environment that we call Qt Creator. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about Qt, Qt Creator later. Uh, maybe you'll even see a little, a little demo or example if we're successful here. <laughs> uh, and um, one of the things that I think is important to mention when we're starting to talk about Qt, which is confusing to a lot of people and which a lot of people don't necessarily understand from the get-go, is that Qt applications are native. And, and that's kind of the foundation for everything that we're thinking about and everything that we are trying to deliver to people. It's native applications, it's C++, and they're running natively, they're compiled natively to each of the platforms that we're supporting. Um, and this is fundamental both to how we're thinking and what we are developing. There's loads of different ways of talking about cross-platform, and we have a lot of other uh, companies and technologies that are talking about cross-platform. Some of them are supporting two operating systems or maybe just two versions of the same operating system and think that's cross-platform. Some of them are interpreted or run in a, in a very restricted sandbox, virtual machine, etc. Uh, but our approach to cross-platform is that we actually want to make it native, and we are in a sense, developing a different set of the library for each of the platforms that we're supporting. That's very important. OK, I wanted just to talk a little bit about where we're coming from. Um, 
the Qt company today is uh, based in Oslo. Our main development site is actually here in Oslo. It's a couple of stops on the subway uh, in Nydalen. Uh, today we're currently in the BI building. We used to be in Valdemar Tranesgata. Uh, a little bit closer to Grinnelöka. A little bit more often people went drunk back to the office after a night on town and sent very responsible emails back to customers and the support team, etc. Uh, but now we're the serious people in Nydalen. Uh, going down and having coffee to look at all the students. Um, so still not so serious, I think that's important. <laughs> Some um, of us are serious. <laughs> <laughs> we are um, around about 200 people right now. Uh, we've been a lot less and we've been a lot more, uh, but I'll get back to that. Um, in Berlin, as I said, we have the main tool team. Here in Oslo, we have the main framework team. Uh, we are apparently owned by a company called Digia that no one has heard of. Uh, that's why we call ourselves uh, the Cute Company. Um, by definition, I think majority decides how you pronounce something. 90% uh, of our users and our customers, and they say QT, but it's always really been cute, and that's what uh, they wanted. That's what we intended when we started, and that's what we are saying. But yeah, if you've heard it talked about as QT, that's completely common. Um, yeah, I think this picture is from 1912. That's around about the time when they started developing Qt. All our former contributors. This is, yes. <laughs> or maybe not. This is the main building at the University in Trondheim, um, at Glöshaun, who would begin. I think this is the first class of uh, graduate students. Maybe they didn't start quite that early, but this is where it all started. Uh, it was developed as a, as a master thesis, as a, as a project um, by Eirik Eng and Hovar Noor at the university in Trondheim. It wasn't even a university at the time, it was a high school or high school. And uh, they started it as a, as a master thesis. And I actually met uh, at a conference, uh, open source developer conference at, at Lotter in Akibrigge a couple of years back. I met their professor and he told me that he had told them that this was a great idea, but you will never make any money of this. Please don't go off and create a company based on this. Please don't, like this is, this is cool, but it's academic. Don't, don't think this will be anything. Uh, 20 years later, we're still here. It's better and bigger than ever. And he was very honest about he now felt that was a huge mistake. So I think it's pretty impressive how far we've come since the days in Trondheim. Um, looking a little bit back, this is actually an early slide, an early, one of the first architecture drawings of what Qt was going to be. This was done in those days. It says 99, or it says on the fax there, it says 96. So I think this is something that Hovar found and later faxed to Eirik a couple of years later. But this is something they sat down and drew together as the architecture of what they wanted to create. Uh, at the time, there weren't many good developer tools. There weren't a lot of easy ways of writing, especially cross-platform applications. But even X11 applications on Linux were hard to write. Uh, so they wanted to make a simpler approach. A lot of the concepts that you see here, or at least some of them, are still valid in Qt today, but a lot of it has changed. But that 20-year-old history of, of writing the same software, of thinking about the same architecture has been, we've, we've been able to um, make that better and better over the years, change what we needed to change, uh, and kept what, what was really good about it. Um, so I don't know how many of you know Qt well enough or, or recognize any of these concepts, but there's quite a lot of stuff here that's still uh, relevant in Qt today. Sorry for the, for the bad uh, resolution there. Um, so quite briefly, um, this is the development that we've been going through, and I think there's a lot of interesting things here. In uh, 1995, 1994, the company was founded. And in 1995, in May, no, in June, in May, in May 1995, we launched Qt 1. So that's 20 years today, or this month, which is pretty cool. Um, and then that was released under a dual license, open source and commercial. At the time, open source was not a very well or specifically defined concept. It was in involvement, it was, it was developing, yeah. and the license that they used for open source 
was some crappy license that didn't really work. And then we I had, had a the fun discussion with Simon Phipps about this actually. And yes, there were no bad examples to learn from yet. So we were one of the first ones. <laughs> Absolutely. This was groundbreaking work. They wanted to be open source, but they didn't really know what it meant at the time because there were no other companies that did dual licensed software as a business model. We created that business model. And we've been sticking to it ever since. But then the open source initiative uh, put down a set of a meta license or, or an idea for what open source should mean. So with Q2, we launched a license called QPL, which was the Qt public license, uh, which was our own written license for, that was, that was um, working well with the idea of open source from, from OSI. Um, and then in Q3, we actually switched to to GPL. So from Q3 and onwards, Qt was GPL and commercially licensed. Uh, so we were pushing that open source commercial model and that's what we've been doing ever since. Um, from Qt3 to Qt4, we did a lot of changes to the architecture. So some of the stuff you, you saw on the previous slide was kind of shaky at that time. We changed a lot of the APIs, which was uh, probably not great for, for a lot of the applications that were developed. I know a lot of uh, a lot of applications, a lot of users and customers were uh, all uh, in uproar because of that. But it is a very good example of showing that we, we were doing the things we needed to do. And then in 2008, we were actually acquired by a mobile manufacturer called Nokia that some of you may have heard of. Um, and uh, they wanted to use Qt to revitalize their UI strategy because they saw they were, as an ecosystem, uh, as a UI, they were completely falling behind the competition. But there were two things I think we learned being in Nokia or that happened during Nokia that was very, very interesting. Maybe three. First of all, I was hired right after they, they were acquired by Nokia. So that was a great move. Um, uh, secondly, they introduced LGPL, uh, which I think was very important. So we moved from GPL as the open source license to LGPL, which allows us to reach a much broader open source community and allow people to do open source development under a much better license. Uh, and then they also launched something called the Qt project that uh, Frederick will talk a little bit more about. But firstly, I just wanted to show some of the outreach and some of the market potential we've had. And a lot of people think that Nokia was the first stint we did with mobile. But a really interesting thing is in 2000, Hovar Noor, he said, embedded Linux is going to be the future of mobile devices. This was long before Android, long before Google were looking at the mobile market, and we launched a green phone, uh, a phone based on Qtopia, which was our embedded Linux offering, Qt as the application ecosystem, uh, and it really was everything that Android is today. We didn't have the marketing money to become as big as Google are now, uh, but we were there even before Google. And then Nokia allowed us to target their platforms, but today, being out of Nokia, we can target all of those mobile platforms that are relevant, and all of those who will be relevant in the short future. Um, so that's kind of the first 20 years. Uh, and I think uh, it's been a great 20 years for, for the product, for the technology. Uh, and one of those things, as I said, that have really enabled us to grow is the contribution model. So maybe Frederick will yeah. look a little bit at what we've been doing there. So is Qt still open source? Well. We are a company, of course, and we do want to make money, but at the same time, we really, really want to play along well with all the people contributing, working with us. We really enjoy uh, using and working with KDE. We're so happy to see that the Plasma desktop finally switched to Qt5, and yes, we still have a lot of uh, crazy people, good people in the company. We are still the trolls. Uh, we have these outdated t-shirts, some of us. and. Um, Yes, we uh, aim with the open governance, which got started by uh, my, our great friend Tiago uh, Masiera. He um, took the open source principles and uh, there were long debates of how we uh, built a proper open source community while having the business. And so our values are the uh, typical values of uh, fairness, transparency, meritocracy and inclusiveness. So the Qt project, which is uh, the label for the open source part, which is basically all we do, and uh, we allow companies then to also license it under a different license to 
uh, allow them to do whatever they please uh, under certain terms, of course. Um, so we, we have this uh, great situation where we are able to work on open source under proper conditions. And um, I wanted to briefly just give an overview of how it works that you contribute to Qt. Um, one thing uh, yeah, Nils didn't mention so much actually is that we, uh, in the Nokia times, towards the end, uh, managed to pull off Qt 5 which is uh, in many ways the basis for all of this. We have um, yeah, the release in 2012. Um, right now we're heading towards Qt 5.5. We finally have time-based releases, so every half a year we manage to do a release. Uh, we have a new graphics stack. We have Qt Quick 2 added, so we are really inventing and revolutionizing how you can do UIs. Um, Qt has been modularized to make it smaller and uh, you can take more small parts out of it. We have better platform abstraction, JSON handling. Uh, we moved to XCB instead of Xlib on Linux and we, of course, are pretty much ready for Wayland. The KDE guys have been doing great experience, experiments. We have uh, Yola and others using Wayland actively. So there's a lot of great stuff going on. So, um, oh yeah. Just as an overview for those that are not so familiar with uh, Qt, um, we do have a lot of modules. Uh, there's yeah, core networking, all, all the basic things you need and that are sometimes missing in the C++ standard library. So it really helps and uh, we have beautiful API that is well documented, uh, which is another great strength. Um, we have new stuff like Web Engine, which is the Blink engine from Google, um, made to play nicely with our stuff. And yeah, you can see the list, it's almost endless. And I think this is one of the big changes that we did from Qt 4 to Qt 5, is that we changed the modularization of the libraries. Uh, we changed how the modules fit together and uh, we made sure that there are no uh, private dependencies between the different modules so that um, or more or less, so that they can be developed independently and so that we can also much more easily allow the open source community to create new modules that will play nice with the framework itself. Yeah. So it's, also it's much easier to deploy part of the framework. That's the important thing. You still want to have all modules from one Qt version. Um, yeah, talking about open governance, uh, who contributes? Um, we actually have a lot of outside contributions, which to me signals that we are a healthy community. And one of the things when I first joined about five years ago, um, external contributions, me coming from KD, of course, I wanted to enable the people I had been uh, dealing with before to contribute to Qt. And we had this great system on um, Gitorius, which is currently shutting down. Um, and you would get merge requests where people send you great patches. And those patches um, would then have to be uh, fetched, uh, tested, and there was like a process list of just about 25 steps, and you were already after a week uh, ready to get this one or two line patch in. So our process was fundamentally broken. But as you can see here now, we have a lot of outside contributions. The bottom two lines are what we uh, Digia still is a bit in there, and the Qt company. So those ones are ours, uh, our contribution, but about 20 or maybe even 25% of the contributions come from the outside. And uh, so I want to explain how we made that possible. And I think the main factor is really that we uh, stopped having two models of how internal people working inside the company made their patches and got them in versus people on the outside. And um, nowadays, we are using Garrett. Um, it's originally developed as part of the Android project. Uh, it's a code review system. And um, I personally don't like the GitHub model too well because it actually messes up your Git history. If you do Git log, you see half the uh, comments in a typical GitHub repository are merges. And it's, it's all a bit messed up. So um, after quite some research in, uh, as part of the Open Governance project, we chose to go with uh, Garrett, where you just push your patch to uh, 
Garrett, and the important part is that you you work from your command line as usual. You have your git, you do git commit, and then you do git push. Um, so to me, that's really convenient. Uh, once you have your patch up, you just add reviewers, and uh, there, of course, it helps when you talk to people. If you just push a patch that nobody ever sees, then, well, your contribution may not go in very fast. But if you uh, talk to people about your patch, uh, discuss it on Garrett, um, well, usually, assuming the patch is actually good, uh, you'll get a plus two. You can uh, then uh, press the submit button, and we run auto tests, and hooray, your patch will be in, or maybe one of the tests fails, which happens occasionally. So then you'll have to fix the patch uh, that wasn't good. Um, yeah. Um, we chose to take a lot of our structure of how we want to set up the project from actually KDE because KDE has been uh, working for a long time and uh, it has the model of give everybody access to everything. Um, we want to do the same with a slight restriction, um, which is that we want to have code review for every patch that goes in and we um, therefore have uh, decided to have approvers. Uh, so the bottom line here of this per permit, the contributors, um, that's basically everybody. Everybody can uh, create an, uh, an account on our bug tracker, push their patches, and um, there are no restrictions, no limits. That's something you can do and get started in five minutes. Um, assuming you, of course, then manage to write the patch in uh, that time frame. Approve us, that's, um, there's a few in the room here. Um, people that have been with the project for a while and um, they get proposed on the mailing list. I don't think we have had it yet that somebody was not granted the approval rights, but of course you're then expected to apply sane standards and when you approve a patch, it would be uh, yeah, reason is expected, so don't approve something in an area where have you, you have no idea or don't feel comfortable. Then we have the maintainers. Um, I happen to be responsible for the accessibility stuff, so um, if there should ever be a conflict or controversial discussion that has not come up in that area, I can say here, this is how we do it. And then we have our chief maintainer, uh, who um, is Lars Knoll, who happens to be our CTO, and he actually has quite the track record with uh, also KDE writing KHTML, which uh, later was forked into WebKit by Apple. I guess many of you know the story. So um, we set up this, yeah, not democracy. There were lots of fun discussions about different models, but this meritocratic model, which so far has uh, worked really very nice and smooth. Um, yeah, that's it from me for now. Mm -hmm. I yeah. hand back to Niels. I just think one thing we want to say is that we also, we encourage all of you to take part in this. Uh, we are using this model. I mean, all of the employees that are developing Qt from within the Qt company, we are adhering to this model. We are contributors, we're approvers. As Frederick, we are maintainers. Yeah. Um, but you can also take those roles. It's not limited to, to us. You can take any of these roles, given enough time and, and effort. And we encourage you to do that. This is a really cool, mainly or at least largely Oslo-based development uh, community uh, that we really hope to, to be growing here as well. But we do have maintainers and approvers en masse outside of the company. So we have a lot of people that we trust in that we give full right to our repositories. Absolutely. So it is truly an open source project in the sense that, yeah, even though we own the copyrights and we make business out of it, it is developed not just by us as a company. And uh, of course, we have goals that we want to do. We take ownership of some of the modules that we see important. But uh, this is open for people to create their own modules, to contribute to those that are existing, and, and actually take an active part in the direction that the product is going to go in. It, there is not like one fixed direction that we are dictating. This is open to the ideas and the contributions of each and one of you, which I think is both very powerful and it is also very important to the quality of the product. Um, yes, uh, we were already talking a little bit about um, that dual licensing was at the heart of uh, what we were doing. Uh, so that was 
uh, yeah, Frederick was talking a little bit about that. But I also wanted to mention that uh, with the latest release of Qt, we've also uh, done something new. We've introduced the LGPLv3 license. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the differences between LGPLv2 and uh, LGPL version 3. Uh, but to us, that has been pretty important because um, we want to be working with the open source community in the best way possible. And there's been a lot of confusion around LGPL version 2.1. And one of the things that we've seen is that, or we want to enable open source users to do true open source innovation. Uh, whereas we want, we don't want people to take the license uh, and uh, try to cheat on the terms and, and work around it. Like if you want to do open source, then we also want you to do open source and not this kind of, yeah, we just trust that nobody cares whether we're breaching the license terms. So LGPL v3 is a lot more clear uh, in the language than LGPL 2.1 was, and I think that's important for uh, us also to keep big corporations a little bit in the airs and say, behave in the correct way. Either you do it in accordance with the open source license or you gotta gotta actually pay for this. And that is an important thing to us. We want the big companies to pay for using it so that we can fund all of the open source development stuff that we're doing. Okay, uh, looking a little bit at the technology, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. We're supporting a lot of different platforms. We're supporting a lot of different ecosystems in creating products. Uh, but how do we, uh, at least internally, kind of manage all of that and what do we focus on? So uh, one of the things that I want to uh, underline is what our internal focus is for development. And we're breaking this mainly into down into two different things, application development and uh, device creation. Uh, so everything that we're talking about, uh, like the devices on an embedded device or the, uh, no, the, the user interfaces on embedded devices or the desktop applications, the mobile phone applications, that's all application development. That's our history, that's where we come from. But one of the challenges and one of the things that is becoming more and more interesting and important is actually being able to create devices. Raspberry Pis are becoming uh, cheap and really fun to work with. Um, but it can be hard to set up those tool chains and to do that whole construction of what you need uh, to get on the device to actually run interesting and fun software. Uh, previously with Qt4, we saw uh, among our customers a failure rate of embedded project at nearly like 50%, not because of Qt, but because just setting up the Linux stuff was so hard on a lot of embedded devices. So we're focusing a lot on the whole tool chain. And we've been using Yocto and using a lot of tools there to make a really simple to use uh, tool chain for embedded devices. And I know that Laszlo will be talking a lot more about this in uh, a follow-up talk in the logo room later today. Uh, so, so internally in how we're thinking, those are the two main categories that we break Qt development down into. Um, Qt is... It has become a really, it's, it's a huge thing, uh, it's a huge project, it's a lot of people using it. Uh, we're present in more than 70 different industries. And I'm kind of confused uh, at some points at uh, how well known Qt is in the world and how little uh, we are actually contributing and participating at events locally in Oslo where we are. So that's one of the things I'm hoping to change over the next few uh, months or years. But uh, there's a lot of cool uh, projects that you're probably already using. Um, I know that, for instance, my set-top box provider, my, my TV provider here in Oslo, uh, they're using Qt. So, so that UI that I see on the screen when I'm uh, changing the channel or looking at information about next programs coming up, that is actually a Qt application. And those are the things that I think is really cool as an employee to see that it's being used. Um, and I think like one of, um, what are the, the value proposition? I think one of the things we've always been saying that was true uh, in the Q2 commercials uh, that they were talking about back then and that ho still holds true is this um, code once, deploy everywhere. Uh, and we really allow you to write your source code one time and deploy it to a number of platforms. Um, looking at, for instance, the mobile market, I know there's a lot of other cross-platform toolkits there that take a little bit different approach than we do and, for instance, allow you to have one unified UI that are calling the native implementations and making different but so-called native UIs on each of those platforms. Uh, that's not the approach we take. We give you uh, much more of a fine granular control over your UI. 
Our idea is with the QML language that Frederick will probably talk a little bit about and show a little bit about later, um, is that you have pixel per pixel perfect control over what your UI will look uh, on each of the platforms that you're targeting. So if you want to create one identity, one application, and have it look actually the same and behave the same on all devices, that's absolutely possible with Qt. Uh, and one of the things that we're seeing more and more is that software today isn't just as much about writing an application and having people run your application on, say, one machine with this OS or one device with this screen size. But applications are becoming services. And when you're creating successful software, people are expecting to run that everywhere. When I'm watching TV, I know that the UI on the, on the TV is there, but I don't want to necessarily look at the TV screen. I want to use my, my tablet or my phone uh, to be able to see what programs are coming up or to select which ones to record, etc. I'm expecting things to be available as services wherever I want them. And that's why true cross-platform with a true pixel-perfect UI is a really important thing. Um, we've been working a lot with the VLC people, for instance. They're across all of the major uh, desktop platforms, and that's all based on Qt. Um, a couple of years back, at least, I don't remember the recent numbers, but that was the most downloaded application on Windows, uh, which gives us a huge user base uh, that are reporting back bugs and reporting back uh, what we need to improve within the framework. Uh, and then you have things like Skype. I guess a lot of you guys in the uh, university environment and the open source communities are using Linux. Skype on Linux uh, was done with Qt. Uh, and we even have a lot of people coming from us that were working for Skype for a while and have actually come back to work for us again. Um, and then on mobile, I think, uh, a little bit as I said, our focus is not so much on the um, app development, uh, the game development, but more on the, on the service development that will be available on a number of different platforms, and especially where you're writing uh, desktop or embedded software that you want to bring also to the mobile as an extended uh, service. But then again, there's also other initiatives on the mobile, and I know that uh, there will be talks later today uh, by Gunnar on, on the Yola uh, Sailfish OS that are, are using Qt. Um, and then for device creation, I won't go too much into detail about what that is because Laszlo will uh, share everything about the power of the Qt for device creation stack. Um, but I think it's really cool to see what kind of people are using Qt for device creation today. And there are so many applications today running Qt. Uh, we've brought with us to uh, uh, Qt Developer Days a couple of years back a coffee machine from a Swiss company where the UI was a touchscreen UI made with Qt. Um, we're seeing cars on the streets, both in the US and in uh, Europe today, that are running Qt-based uh, in-vehicle infotainment systems. Uh, Tesla is one of those companies that are actually using Qt for their in-car UI. Um, we are working with a company called Magneti Marelli. Nobody have heard of them because they're delivering to the OEMs, to the car brands. So their software, I mean, their company name isn't very well known outside, but the companies they're delivering to are some of the hugest European car brands. So several of the new cars coming out here in Europe this year and last year, all of the stuff there is based on Qt. Uh, Ford is actively taking part in the contribution model and contributing uh, source code back into Qt, using it a lot. Um, I don't know whether they've released a car yet with Qt in it, but I know that that's going to happen. And that's awesome. So there are so many opportunities here for Qt developers to take part in those ecosystems. And I think one of the important things there, especially with when you're looking at stuff like set-top boxes and cars, it's not just about creating one UI or one application there, and that's static, that's something that you run. I mean, a car you bought five years ago, you couldn't do much with, with the software in it. You couldn't do much with the UI in it. That was, it was what it was. It was very static. Uh, but more and more today, that is just the base platform. And what those companies want to do is to enable us to change, to install things. You want to have Spotify available in your car. You want to have different services available. And to be able to do that, they need to 
create ecosystems. So they are building not just applications using Qt, but they're building platforms. They're building a whole ecosystems with third-party development tools. And those third-party development tools, more often than not, are based on Qt. Um, and one of the reasons they can do that, I mean, we have a very broad uh, developer offering uh, within Qt. Uh, I don't know how much you've used Qt, but there's a number of different things you can do. And uh, traditionally, we have the Qt widgets, that C++-based API. Uh, you can write very traditional uh, standard desktop uh, applications. But I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with that. But we've released Qt Quick, which is an API that allows you to do much more flexible and fluid user interfaces. Uh, yep. We will look a little bit more at that later. But we also have, as you mentioned, the KHTML that became WebKit, that became Blink, <laughs> Web Engine Story. So you can make hybrid UIs. I know that in the set-top box industry, this is pretty big, that people are actually using Qt as the base platform. And then they're allowing third-party developers to use HTML as the app ecosystem by using the, the Qt Web Engine as a basis for showing those HTML5 based apps on their platform. Um, here in Norway, we have a lot of um, commercial customers that are actually building these kind of ecosystems. One of them is in the oil industry. I unfortunately can't say the name, uh, but they're building these huge rigs and they have this awesome, I was the, at a convention in Stavanger and I get to try this large chair with two uh, joysticks and I think it was 18 screens, uh, lots of information, all built with Qt. And the idea there is that as you're installing a new crane or a new whatever device on that ship or on that rig, that software will automatically be part of that whole platform. So all of that is done with Qt. But then there's open source projects doing the same thing, uh, building yeah. a whole ecosystem around Qt. And of course, so KDE is... One of the big use cases, exactly. Uh, I wanted to show you my desktop, which is finally Qt5 based. Uh, of course, then my laptop didn't like connecting here, so <laughs> we decided to just switch over to Neil's laptop. Um, so we'll have to improvise a bit, but uh, what we thought is just don't just talk, but let's also show a tiny bit of uh, code because it's actually quite fun. Uh, Absolutely. Can I just uh, let's see. Okay. So we are improvising a tiny bit on the hardware part. All right. Yeah. That's fun. I just need to stop. Uh... Oh, of course. No. Arrangement. Here. Oh. There you go. Sweet. And then you probably want to have your uh, main file. Yeah, not so important. I can. Is I think it's again? actually never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll just uh, do the whole thing. So um, yeah. Um, so this is my version of Qt Creator on my Mac, and I don't use this machine for development a lot. So, so let's just we'll see, see if, if anything, anything works. works here at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, but maybe you can explain what we're looking at here right now. So this is exactly Qt Creator is our IDE, which uh, we recommend using, especially when you're doing anything with Qt Quick. And you have this nice uh, wizard here that lets you create, for example, a new Qt Quick application and live coding C++. I have done it a couple of times. It's always a bit fiddly. Um, I feel more comfortable. Uh, creating a tiny uh, UI in Qt Quick. So I'll just uh, start creating a new um, application here. Let's call it OSDC. And all right. One of the things that I also wanted to say about Qt Creator uh, and about Qt in general is that we have a very open philosophy not just about that we want to do dual licensed software and allow people to do open source development, but we want to allow people to choose the tool they feel are best. Qt Creator is a great choice for C++ applications in general and Qt applications specifically, but it's not mandatory. Yeah. You don't have to use it. Internally, a lot of our developers have been using uh, VI or uh, Emacs, but more and more, they're actually switching to Qt Creator, not because we tell them to, but because they want to and because it's getting really, really good. Um, but this is something that we encourage you to use when you're learning Qt, and even if you're a very skilled Qt developer, 
uh, but we're not forcing you. And I think that's a key part of how we want to work. We never want to force this or that way of working. So let's see. Yeah, I uh, get Nils' email. Cool. <laughs> um, so, oh yeah, this, so maybe I shouldn't be full screen. Where's the thing? Uh, this is a Mac. I'm not always a Mac person. Um, so yeah, then we will do full screen the old way. Um, so I just have a very simple, call it application here. It's just this one file basically. Um, it has a couple of import lines at the top which just say, give me these uh, components, make them available. And then I um, get a window here, application window, and um, it's pretty easy to understand this actually, uh, even if you have never seen the language before, it's uh, JavaScript inspired and uh, a declarative language that just lets me say what I want and it'll uh, figure out how to put it on screen. So I say the title should be Hello World, um, well we can fix that, Hello OSDC and uh, yeah, I ha just specify the size and uh, that it should be visible, which is important because when you have several windows, you usually don't want all of them to pop up at the same time. But the main one we want to make visible here. So, um, and actually let's just take a plain old window. Application window tries to follow the platform styling. So here I just have my white surface to do anything I please with. And, uh, so bear with me, I'll be improvising because we switched laptop, um, but uh, yeah, what what we want, of course, oh, is Norwegian keyboard, yes. Um, <laughs> no, maybe we don't, sorry. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can change the keyboard layout. Excellent, Top, uh, so, uh, right I, yeah, I got it. Um, so I can just create stuff in here that's like, um, a rectangle is, well, you can guess what it is. Um, anybody? No, I'm not going to let you guess. Um, but what is interesting is that I can reference other elements. So I can, for example, in my rectangle say, I want to refer to the parent and uh, have it the same width. So this new rectangle, which is a primitive element and in a real application, of course, you don't start fiddling with rectangles, but you start building uh, components that you reuse, and then uh, this is how really it's, it gives you full control, but, and it's a pleasure to uh, write UIs this way once you uh, get going with it a bit. Um, so let's just give it a height also, and we'll just say 200 or so, and um, the thing will be invisible because by default it's white. So let's have a color, and then I had beautiful uh, OSDC colors, uh, which of course, n yeah. Um, maybe I can steal them from the email. Is that? Uh, here. I tried to steal the colors from the website. Let's see if that works. Let's just run this. Yeah, okay, I think this is the background we have on the website. So I thought I'd just uh, create, kind of recreate the OSDC logo. I don't have the proper fonts now, but um, you can see where it's going. So now I have a window with this uh, gray bar and, uh, well, let's put a text inside the title bar. And to do that, I just declare a text element and I uh, say the text should be uh, OSDC Oh, that needs to be a string, and I don't know the shortcuts here. Yep, the OSDC Nordic, for example. Um, and then by default, elements are just placed at the top left. So A, it's black, B, it's in squ squeezed into the corner. But um, I'll use another really convenient mechanism, which is anchoring. So I can just say, oh, this element, I want to attach it to, well, let's put it in the center of our rectangle. And uh, to, that, to do that, I just write anchors.center in, and you see I have this beautiful auto-completion so that I don't make as many typos as I usually do. Um, so I'll just center it in the parent. And uh, of course, we want to give it a color. Um, so now we have a tiny white text. 
one step further. Let's also give it um, point size. Uh, it's font dot point size uh, and what you like, something like 48 or so sounds about sensible. And then we're almost there, but if you look at the website, of course, we uh, actually have to have the OS uh, nicely green. And uh, let me cheat again, stealing the color code. Um, so um, since CSS seems to be the hotness, we had the fun uh, Raptor presentation. Let's just throw in some uh, CSS like, or is this HTML like stuff? I never know the difference really. Um, so, oh, and then see if it works. So. Um, they are pretty easily, I have an almost good imitate of the website, of course. The font is off, but uh, this is how you can uh, create, once you get a design, uh, really nice UIs. It's a uh, pleasure to work with. And I see we're slowly running short on time, so um, do uh, shoot questions towards us. Um, there's one in the background. Yes. Sure. All right. Thousand questions. Uh, can you perhaps briefly explain uh, when I should use Qt Quick and when I should use Qt? And does one have limitations yeah. over the other or advantages over the other? Yeah, both of them have uh, advantages, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't have two of them. Um, for traditional UIs, um, if you want an uh, like business uh, UI, um, in some cases, uh, the traditional way of creating the UI with cute widgets might still be um, easier to get started. And it's at the moment still easier to follow the platform specifics. But for anything interesting, um, you where you want to use animations and make things dynamic and fluid and uh, look actually beautiful and shiny, um, you want to use Qt Quick, and one of the big things uh, we uh, looked at when uh, Qt 5 came about, and even earlier, is how do you actually um, make graphics? Why do games manage to be fast on the graphics card, and why is a traditional application so slow in drawing? So uh, Gunnar is actually the expert, I would say, and uh, Laszlo, of course, too. So um, they will later be talking at least somewhat in that direction. I'm looking forward to some great OpenGL stuff from Laszlo. Um, so the thing is that we want to properly create textures and uh, let use the power of the graphics card to do things in parallel. And the scene graph um, that we use for OpenGL and for Qt Quick um, is actually much better at uh, doing this. So you basically use the graphics card the way it's meant to be used. Uh, so that is the huge advantage of Qt uh, Quick. So, But just one additional comment, and I think it's important to clear up that Qt Quick um, and Qt Widgets are two different UI technologies, but they're both Qt. And Qt Quick is not something different from Qt. Uh, you still have access to all of the C++ modules, and you can build applications in exactly the same way. You can connect signals and slots between your C++ implementation and the uh, elements in your QML files, etc. So there are not two different architectures. It's just a different UI layer on top of the Qt framework. Uh, and I think there's also there has been a little bit of confusion about that when we're talking about it, and especially when we introduced uh, QML in the scene graph, and people were asking if we were moving away from C++ completely. That is not the case at all. Qt is still firmly based on C++ and the APIs that we're exposing are C++, but we have this UI layer on top of it that allows you to create fluid, super nice animations and, and UIs uh, with your Qt application. Um, we've also now introduced the option for uh, mixing the two schemes so that you can have QML UIs uh, or part of your UI 
can be QML and part of it can be a traditional widget-based application. So it's easy to move, say, from a widget-based Qt4 application to Qt5 and then introduce a little bit more and a little bit more uh, QML-based content into that old um, or legacy Qt widget-based application. Uh, so, so it's not two different things, it's just different modules and, and technologies within the same framework. So it's quite fun how easy it is to add some funky animations. Of course, you don't want this in a real application. Initially, I, I had a rotating cute logo, but uh, that was on the other laptop. So, um, yeah, this technology just enjoy, uh, encourages you to also play with, and then hopefully in the real application, you'll be much more subtle. Don't have everything rotate and blink and whatnot, but it's fun. So I think we have another question. Uh, last question. So you uh, re-licensed from uh, LGPL 2 to 3, and if I'm, oh, I don't know exactly, but I think there's uh, additional uh, pattern text in the LGPL 3. Mm -hmm. Did you have a huge review of uh, all, uh, everyone who have contributed, and if they had held any patterns, or how did you do it? Uh, that's a very technically differ, uh, difficult question. Um, I don't uh, know the full process around patent uh, investigation internally within the contributions. So how I've understood it so far is that LGPL3 is much stronger in protecting against patents so that you are not um, allowed to implement software patents with LGPL3, or you're allowed to do that, but if you're actually trying to enforce them and sue somebody for breaking your patent, you automatically lose your licensing. Uh, so, you're, so you're in breach of license contract if you're trying to do that. But we haven't done, or, and I don't think it's a problem for us uh, if people, um, yeah. Uh, but the other thing is, Uh, we have not introduced LGPL v3 for everything yet. We haven't changed anything so far. What we've done is that new modules that are being integrated to Qt uh, are, that are developed by us are uh, licensed under LGPL v3. Uh, and then we're looking at if we can change more and more of the existing stuff over to LGPL v3 over time. And we're, of course, we have lawyers looking at it and making sure that everything is according to that, but I'm not a lawyer and... I guess Suna has a comment towards that. Do we still have half a minute? Uh, I, I guess regarding pa uh, uh, patents uh, for software uh, patches implemented by others, part of submitting code to Qt, you actually have to uh, yeah. promise Qt as a project that uh, yeah. you are giving hmm. the, the same license uh, to a patent as the LGPL v3 are are giving out, so there, there shouldn't be a need for, for any extra uh, no. kind of that. Yeah. So that is uh, what the LGPL3 especially tried to address, right? Mm. Yeah. So we're, we're, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. We, are, we have that legal language in the contribution model so that you are, um, yeah, if you're in breach of that when you're contributing M to the Qt project, then that's your problem, not ours. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but Thank you very much. We do have t-shirts for those of you who ask questions. If any of you have more questions later, then just come talk to myself or Frederick or any of the other cute guys, and we will have some t-shirts for, for those of you who are interested. <laughs> thank and, you. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot.